And now it's time to discuss the latest scalability solution for the Web3 ecosystem, the Orbit Chains. Arbitrum Orbit became main ready just a few days ago. This happened, this, this happened on October 26th. This has been less than a month now. So now you can build permissionlessly, permissionlessly a customized chain using the most advanced and secure scaling tech in the world. And you can customize its privacy, permissions, fee token, governance, and more. So here with us, we have Matthew, Matthew Katz, Caldera's co-founder and CEO, Amrit Kumar Altlayer's COO, and A.G. Warner of Chain, of Chain Labs, Chief Strategies Officer. And yeah, they are here with us to share their latest insights about it. So yeah, let's get started and welcome. Hi, hey, everyone. Can you hear hey, me? hi. Thanks, Anna, for that. Really appreciate it. Um, good morning, Matt. I know I think it's probably early for you, if I had to guess, unless you're not in San Francisco. I'm still in San Francisco, indeed. So it's just turned 6 a.m. here. So thanks for joining us at such an early hour. Amrit, are you in Istanbul? Yes, yeah. So it's about 5 p.m. here. So. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I'll do a brief intro by myself, but obviously everyone's here excited to hear from the two of you. So I'm AJ, Chief Strategy Officer at Offchain Labs. I've um, been building in the Arbitrum ecosystem for about three years now. Um, it's been amazing this journey from a test net to um, now um, dozens of orbit chains at this point getting ready to launch later this year, probably early Q1 for many. So I'm um, really excited to learn and talk about this, um, I would say, budding evolution and sort of the implementation of the technology. Um, Let's do some brief intros and I'll get into it. So Matt, do you want to, do you want to get us started? Yeah, for sure. So yeah. Hi everyone. Also really, really great to be here. Um, I'm Matt, sorry. Um, CEO and co-founder of Caldera, uh, which, which kind of means I have a hand in everything like engineering product, BD, et cetera. Um, Caldera is a rollups as a service provider where the easiest way to deploy managed rollups, uh, using top orbit stacks, uh, top rollup stack, which includes orbit. Um, and we also uh, help those chains build all the tooling they need. So things like block explorers, indexers, bridges, et cetera. Um, and we also connect them to a bunch of integration partners. We have over 50 now. Um, so, so yeah, I'll pass it over to Amit. Hey, hi, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Amit Kumar. I handle operations at Otle. Uh, very similar to Caldera, we are a roll-up service provider and uh, Arbitrum is something that we are very excited to support. And we support that uh, through many of our clients. Um, we very similar to Caldera. We also offer uh, you know different services. So imagine our end goal is to make sure that even a marketing person, a BD person, should be able to go and launch an orbit chain for themselves. Right? Should be able to customize them quite easily. Um, and we also save a lot of BD uh, time and effort uh, when you want to get some of the external service providers integrated. For example, let's say your explorer, your your indexers, uh, and the like. So um, our goal is to really make it easier for you to deploy and have your own block space. Awesome. Cool. So I have a bunch of questions that I want to go through. If we don't get through all of them, the conversation takes us a different way. I'm very happy for us to be have an open conversation and dialogue. And if there's conversations, Matt and Amrit, that you guys want to have with each other, then you know feel free to have those directly. Um, but I'm going to try and steer the conversation. So you guys both referenced Orbit. So for the audience who might not know, Orbit is this mechanism for essentially launching Arbitrum chains, um, standalone outside of Arbitrum 1 and Arbitrum Nova. The overall majority of those chains are layer three technologies that settle to Arbitrum one, either using any trust, which is external data availability, or you know, maybe something like Celestia as those continue to evolve and grow, or posting their data, you know, directly to Ethereum. And also layer twos, so we're starting to see some of those frame recently and launched. Um, we can call these app chains orbits. Maybe let's just stick to orbit, obviously, for the sake of the Arbitrum audience, which is familiar with that concept, but I felt like introducing that is important. But over the last six months, I think both in the Arbitrum ecosystem and outside of the Arbitrum ecosystem, we've seen an explosion of, of these sorts of chains. What do you think is driving this trend? Um, Amr, I'll start with you. I would say the two things. I mean, of course, the technical bits and there's also this ecosystem and what's happening in the broader, uh, you know, gap space as well. So one is the fact that there are stacks today, uh, it makes it easier. Previously, you had to take, let's say, you know, Arbitrum or, or any of the, you know, base layer L2s and they basically forked them and then you could have your own chains. Uh, most of them actually tried that and they ended up building other general purpose L2s. So now that has become much easier because now you have SDKs, so you can go and spin up some of these instances quite quickly. And then of course we have partners like 
you know, Calera and, and, and us, so we can make it even easier for you, so that you know uh, you don't have to go and even manage any of these things yourself. So even if you don't understand what a sequencer means, if you don't understand you know, what a DAC means, that already gets handled by us. So I would say that's that's the uh, you know the two technical parts. The third thing about what I've what I would say is we have seen quite a bit of interest from game developers, and I think that has been a push quite a lot over the last year or so. And I think. Games in particular are quite interesting because a lot of them actually want to make sure that they can control the infrastructure, right? Because they want to make sure that, let's say, they offer the best gaming experience to end clients. And you can only do that in certain scenarios if you control the infrastructure, right? And so I would say the growth uh, in the gaming sector, especially fully on-chain games, uh, but if you're building, let's say, fully on-chain game, in some cases, your contracts can be very huge to a point where you cannot even go and deploy that on a general purpose chain, right? So you want something that you can go and customize. And so I would say that you know games in general has also given a quite a bit of push for people who want to have their own stack or who want to have their own infrastructure. So I would say these three reasons. Awesome, Matt. Anything you want to add there? Yeah, um, not too much. Totally agree with what uh, Amrit said. I think as well, like one of the the general things that's that's pushing this narrative is just a lot of people I think are building for bigger use cases um, as they're kind of anticipating the next bull run. We've seen like. A lot more interest in games, of course, which are going to have you know hundreds of thousands of users, probably at minimum, for a successful game, which is way more than most DeFi protocols have. Um, things like social, things like friend tech, you know, uh, we've we've also seen a big explosion in like identity protocols, like Worldcoin, etc., payments, etc. So like all these folks are really thinking about how they're going to build applications that launch to like millions of users, and I think that's when you start thinking about these like harder scaling infrastructure types of concerns. Yeah, I think that definitely makes a lot of sense, right? Like. And this has been a position that I've, you know, publicly stated. Like, if you're if you're scaling to like hundreds of thousands of users, you're going to need dedicated block space, right? And that's just the reality. And there's going to obviously be trade offs with composability, and those are problems that we're all looking to solve in different ways. Um, Amr, you touched on gaming. Matt, you touched on sort of different use cases, more at focus of scale. Um, are there specific kinds of projects or verticals that you're most excited for focusing on chains at this time? Like, you know, obviously, you can have everything from DeFi to payments, like. Is there a specific vertical that you think like now it makes the most sense? Um, and Matt, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, and we actually started this company with the sole focus on games back in 2022. And we ended up expanding our focus because uh, we just found like the types of projects that would approach us are super diverse. Uh, like they basically fit into all the categories I mentioned before and more, but we still got DEXs, got folks who are building like NFT protocols or NFT ecosystem chains, some folks doing ZK. Um, so the thing we found is like, there aren't specific verticals, but there are kind of things that unite a lot of the, the teams that we work with. And it's some combination of like customizability, so, you know, some of the things actually that Vitalik was just talking about before this panel, some teams are trying to experiment there, some amount of scale. Um, and also, I guess like another thing that kind of, uh, uh, unifies all the teams we're working with, at least on the app chain side are like, they don't require atomic composability, um, in, in any meaningful way. Um, with things that are outside their ecosystem. So things like games that are pretty isolated, these like perp dexes, which are pretty isolated, payments networks uh, that are all pretty isolated and don't need to like, you know, they're not building like money Legos, like Uniswap or like Zero X that are just like lower level kind of primitives that they want other protocols to build on top of. They don't need to like call out to like a bunch of different smart contracts on some general purpose chain. Those are the applications right now that are looking to launch their own chain. Um, I'm right. And, 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 yeah, if, if I may add one point to it, I mean, I completely agree with what Matt what was saying, and we have seen similar, uh, you know, things as well on our side. But one, I guess, thing that we have also seen uh, that Matt I didn't mention, uh, which I'd like to add, is we have also seen some people building, let's say, real-world assets, right? So, well, let's say, imagine building tokenized, tokenized equities and those sort of things. And their use case is not necessarily about scalability, because even if you go and build, let's say, a platform that does tokenized, uh, you know, sells tokenized equities, the volume, the transaction volume may not be that high. Maybe dollar volume might be high, but the transaction numbers may not be that high. But the reason they want to go and use their own stack is one, they want to be able to bake some sort of a whitelisting mechanism, some sort of a compliance mechanism into, into the system. Previously, what they had to do was they had to build this entire app and they have their own wallet within that app or something where you basically block them at the app level. What they want to do is to bake them at the network level, right? So they want to say, hey, uh, I could send my transactions directly to, um, I could bypass that wallet, I could bypass the app and could send transactions directly to the net network. 
And now I want to block that. So now if you send a transaction to the sequencer, the sequencer has some sort of a whitelist mechanism that gets updated, let's say every, every week or so. And the sequencer will basically block you uh, and you won't send your transaction, won't let you process your transaction if, it, if it's not in the, in the list. And so this way it, um, it, it becomes more cl compliant. So it's not necessarily about, necessarily about you know, scalability and block space, but more about compliance in this case. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's one of the things actually that I've been focusing on. I think that at least in the short term, the the a really important focus of and you know it's actually going to lead into my next question. Really important focus around the the application specific chain thesis, the orbit chain thesis is is this sort of deviation from just a standard EVM deployment, right? And I think that one of the cool things about the orbit chain and sort of the SDK that we've been trying to build it off chain is like allowing that flexibility to exist. Right, so we you know we've been working with Psy um, on building like a gaming chain with them. Contract size limits for them was critical, right? Because they have like a fully on-chain game, and it's just like it would have been you know months more engineering efforts if it was just like 24k, you know, contract size limits. And I think that I think that's a great point, and you know we've been seeing demand for like sort of you know KYCing at the chain, either using service providers or you know. Um, you know, I think folks are trying and experimenting, you know, with, with different things. And I don't want to front run you guys if you're talking about this. I'm about to ask you guys a question. But, like, you know, royalty enforcement on a chain, for example. Like all these really cool things, sort of what Talek was talking about, I think also is, is what gets me really excited. So what features have you guys seen in the highest demand? Like, what customizations? I guess it obviously depends on vertical. But, like, where, what are you guys seeing from your customers as being, like, the most frequent requests for, um, for customizations? And um, Amr, we'll start with you on this one. This is some basic ones, which is, hey, I have my 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 big contract, can I deploy this, right? So basically, some basic high-level network changes. So uh, you know, the the size of contract that you can deploy, uh, the broad class limit, so that I can process heavier transactions. Um, of course, a fee token that you know this protocol or this app may already have a token, and they want to make sure that that token gets used in some way at the at the you know sequencer level. So in terms of fees. Uh, we have seen, as I mentioned, you know, compliance uh, whitelist of some sort. So you bake that compliance list in the sequencer. Um, we have seen gasless transaction demand without ab account abstraction, right? So account ab abstraction, of course, makes sense, um, uh, you know, in many scenarios. But one of the base use cases of account abstraction is kind of gasless, uh, you know, experiences that you give to end users. And account abstraction generally makes sense when you have, let's say, a general purpose chain. But if you have an app specific chain, you could say, hey, I don't want to have any notion of gas token at all. Uh, and I can do that because it's my it's my roller. And you could say, hey, because I have my app and my app, um, you know, has some sort of a fee involved. So imagine something like the OpenSea or or Uniswap sitting on a roller, and every single time you send a transaction to uh, uh, to Uniswap, Uniswap basically charges you a fee anyway. So this way you can prevent spam without actually having having a gas token directly natively on the network. So some of these people are experimenting with that where no gas at all, and I can my user base. Do not have to go to Coinbase and Binance and other places to go and acquire the gas token at all. So I would say some of these ex these are some of the some of the you know changes and customization that they would like to we have seen uh, demand for. Awesome. Yeah. What about you, Matt? Yeah, I don't have too much to add to that. We've been seeing all the same things. Um, I guess the the one other thing I'll, I'll maybe double click on is the the kind of custom transaction processing logic. So like we you know you might call it whitelisting. Whitelisting is one of the many things you could do uh, with with such logic, right? Uh, AJ, you you mentioned you know you can enforce KYC. That's a form of whitelisting. But you can basically use any on-chain data or potentially off-chain data to determine who can make transactions on the chain, what transactions they can make, etc. So we're seeing some really cool things around royalty enforcement, which which you touched upon, which is just like blocking certain transactions that you might view as kind of like anti-social or, or against the spirit of the chain. I mean, NFT transactions that. Uh, that like don't enforce royalties. You can kind of extend that that principle to all sorts of different things. You can even have eventually on-chain governance governing those rules or like the constitution uh, of the chain and who's allowed to make transactions and what types of transactions they're allowed to make. We're seeing a lot of experimentation in that uh, sort of realm and, and it's still early, but there's like a lot of really interesting stuff coming out of that. And how have you guys seen like these changes scaling for your teams, right? Like obviously you guys have engineering teams internally, getting familiar with different stacks. You know, obviously you want to be careful, like what are we, what are we changing? What are we not changing? And like working closely with our team is like a, I guess an important component of that. But like, is, is there something that like somebody's ever asked you? And you're like, okay, we can't do that. That's in, that that's that's too insane. Or like, what you know? How how, how how far does this extension go? Yeah. So I I think for us, like, yeah, th there are definitely things that we have given pause to, or have like kind of like 
quietly tried to like nudge people away from. Um, the thing that I think is most, I'm trying to think of an example. The, the thing that comes to mind is um, interesting kind of token logic for the like custom tokens. Some people, some people want to do like rebase tokens or just like weird kind of supply changes to their native token. Those are often really difficult to reason about and can lead to, to, to just like issues in general um, on the chain. Um, the, like for us as a team, um, we generally take like a relatively unopinionated approach. Like, you know, if a project comes to us and they say, we want to do X, our kind of prior assumption is like, they want to do X for good reason. Even if that implementation is mistaken, we should at least hear them out and figure out, um, you know, how we can get them to the goals, uh, that they're trying to achieve. Um, but the really nice thing that we're seeing is that, uh, actually it requires a lot less engineering support from our end. Than it did even like two quarters ago. Like a lot more people are becoming familiar with like the Orbit stack, making modifications to to Ethereum, Go Ethereum, Nitro, and so like we do have teams come to us and they're basically saying like, "Hey, we've made these modifications. Do you think this would work? Like, what what are your thoughts on this?" And we'll maybe kind of guide them in the right direction, but we're not doing a lot of that like integration work ourselves. I would say that two. It's not customization. I mean, one is customization. The other one is more like. I guess, feature requests that I think comes from many of these people. Uh, one is um, with the rise of, I guess, or, or the, the idea that Canto came up, you know, you can have contract owned, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the right term that they call it, but it's more like contract owned fees in some way. Um, and people are now coming with all complex ideas around this, where you say, hey, you know, there are dApps and that share with other dApps fees and things like that, it becomes a bit more complicated to implement. Uh, simpler ones are still okay, but if you go read, you know, really deep into the rabbit hole of how you want to build the entire economics, uh, that becomes a little bit tricky uh, underneath the hood. Um, so yeah, I would say that's that's one one crazy see, crazy things that we have seen people experimenting with. Hopefully, at some point, we'll have simpler models that people can just pick and you know, right. you know use them yeah, I mean, template. But otherwise, it... as a non-engineer on our team, and I'm always just like, why don't we just make that change? As if it's like you know, changing it, like swapping out like a Lego block. And people are like, no, that would be months of work, you know? And it's like, it's sometimes, you know, it's not intuitive to people who aren't familiar with the stack. Um, so, you know, obviously it's Arbitrum Day. We're here to talk about Arbitrum Orbits, you know, app chains, et cetera. Like as Anna mentioned sort of at the intro, Orbit's been, you know, sort of in a mainnet ready state for only a few days now. So it's really just come to the market. It's extremely uh, nascent. You know, I think we've seen a lot of really exciting demand um, what have you guys seen? What is what is the excitement from application developers, your clients? Um, what, what what's exciting them about Orbit, and um, what's the general feedback been so far? Matt, when you give it, when you start first. Sure. Yeah, I think um, the the overarching thing we've seen from folks building on Orbit is they're just excited about the possibility and the customizability and the fact that that seems to be really heavily encouraged by the Arbitrum team, the off-chain labs team, and, and the community at large. Um, I think like in general, the, the trade-offs that, that people think about when they're looking at roll-up stacks, like they're, you know, they're thinking about like the policies of these individual communities, kind of like how much support they're going to be able to get. And I think like for a lot of teams, they're fine with deploying as an L3. They want to make modifications. They want to know that, the, that those modifications will, will be supported. And they want to do it on a stack where like they know that those modifications can still be like secure generally if they do it right. So you have like working fraud proofs, those fraud proofs are being run on Wasm. So you can compile any changes you make. It's really easy to make those changes. You don't need to deal with, you know, writing customized ZK circuits or anything like that. Um, so generally, like, I think that's why we're seeing a lot of, uh, take up, um, in, uh, of orbits. There are also some things that I think a lot of projects are really excited about. The number one thing that we hear about is any trust. People really like the idea of off-chain DA. For folks in the audience who don't know, DA costs are like 90, 95, you know, plus percent of the cost of running a chain. So any way to like lower that means that you're enabling a whole bunch of other use cases, makes it a lot cheaper to run a chain, which for, you know, a small team or like a mid-sized startup uh, is, is really important. And it can also like increase the profit margins of the chain as well. So generally like we're seeing a lot of interest there. Um, and then the last thing I think Thing everyone's talking about right now is stylus, like Wasm, smart contracts, the ability to write your smart contracts in Rust or C or C++. Um, people are really excited about that. It's still really early, but you know, a lot of people are mentioning that and asking how they can use that in their, in their chains or if they can use it in their chains. Um, so we're really, really excited to see how that evolves. I have a whole bunch of thoughts, but Amr, give us your thoughts, then I'll jump jump in there. Yeah, if, if I may add one, I think, I think Matt's response was very uh, comprehensive, but I, there was one thing that I'd like to highlight. 
which by the way, not many people know, uh, at least people who come to us, and which is about this fact that, you know, there are not many stacks out there where you have non-constant block time, right? Which is which is which is very essential for many people. So imagine, um, you know, you are forced to generate a block even if there's no transaction at all, and in some cases that's that's costly, right? And so and that's something that you know um, at the moment you know Arbitrum Orbit offers you. So uh, and that's that's one of the cool features that I think um, one is is not not doesn't get enough attention. And I think we should uh, you know. Uh, promote that and when we talk to clients they realize this very quickly once they start once we start set up a node for them and they start seeing trans transaction going through they realize that okay uh you know it's it's, it's non-constant which means that i don't my sequence doesn't have to produce unnecessary blocks if it doesn't have to and that i think one one killer feature that i think uh you know orbit has it's funny because i was going to bring that one up as well and it's like a total accident i think right like i don't think when we design the non-constant block feature like it was obviously a relic before orbit was was a primary driver we wanted like super quick you know sequencer response times and we obviously only wanted to be triggering those right like the arbitrum stack right on the public chains is 250 milliseconds right so you only want to generate that snappy response if there's actual transactions otherwise it's a lot of blocks so it was just the kind of thing that that we that we had and it's funny how it's sort of evolved into this like critical feature i think especially you know for non high throughput environments that want their own um, that want their own, that want their own, that they want their own chain. Um, one other thing, and I think, you know, um, Matt from Conduit actually talks about this a fair bit is when you use an any trust tile system or alternative DA, it's much easier to use your native custom fee token because then you don't have like a huge sell pressure on the token in order to be able to pay your ETH costs. Like you don't have that constant treasury management. So I think that's probably also, you know, part and parcel of why you're seeing a lot of demand for alternative DA. It's because a lot of these chains that want their own custom fee token, it's, it's, probably a logistical nightmare to think about, you know, the volatility of a native token and having constant fixed pay payments that you have to make in ETH if you're posting, or with variable payments that you have to pay, pay in ETH if you're posting, you know, significantly to, to L2. Um, Alternative DA has been a huge theme. You know, I, I'm not in Istanbul, but, you know, I know there's been a ton of conversations in Istanbul about this. You know, Celestia recently launched, Near just announced they're changing. They're, they're going to have a DA product, obviously, Eigen as well. Um, what are you guys seeing about this? What's your, you know, what's your take on um, how is this going to evolve? Like, what are the, what do you think is going to be the differentiators for um, your clients in thinking about different solutions? Um, Amr, why don't you start and maybe let us know which which DAs you intend to support? Yeah, so we're definitely seeing. I mean, before um, you know, previously, if you're if you're a DAP builder, um, you're you had basically two choices. You know, you could go and operate in a in a roll up in a roll up mode where you send transactions uh, to Ethereum, or the second one was a DAC. And by the way, again, there are very handful of uh, stacks out of there that actually support DAC natively out of the box. Right, so that's that's definitely Orbit's one advantage there. Um, of course, with the launch of Celestia and other other you know, in the lineup, it, it does seem that there's quite a bit of interest for people who want to tap into that ecosystem and, you know, leverage a more decentralized, if, if, if you like, uh, you know, these, you know, data availability layer. But I think it's still many of the things are still quite early. Uh, things are still being built, um, you know, and so I feel like, and I think there's also a cost to it in some way, right? Some people do feel like, okay, you know, if I, if I keep my DAC, it might be cheaper for me initially. Um, so I think there's a cost aspect, which is, Probably will become clear over the next few months or so, but it feels like people will have to see some cost, uh, you know, coming in and see how that how that behaves compared to what their current setup might look like. So if it's a DAC, so yeah, I, I think there there is a cost to modularity, and I think that's something that will that will be more visible in the coming coming months. Hey Matt, any thoughts on on DAs? Yeah, um, I, I'm also very excited about Alt DA. Uh, actually, one of the reasons. One of the things that inspired us to start Caldera was we read the Celestia paper before it was called Celestia back in the day when it was called Lazy Ledger. And that really inspired us to think about modular blockchains. Um, and so we're, we're really excited about it. Um, I do think a lot of teams are thinking that all DA networks like Celestia, Eigen, Near, and we plan to support all three eventually. Like we, I think a lot of teams think of that as sort of like the sweet spot. They, they want to make sure DA is posted to some sort of decentralized network, but they don't want that decentralized network to be Ethereum, uh, just due to the cost. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think only time will tell how things play out. Like we we're seeing a lot of promises right now. Celestia like just launched the other folks, uh, that are working on this are pre-launch. And so 
I, I think like it, it's still unknown whether it's even going to be like a winner take all market, what the demand for blob space is going to be, et cetera. Um, I think like generally users and rollups will win by there just being available blob space, but um, we don't have like super strong theses about how the, you know, the end state of the, of this space looks like. Awesome. We only have about two minutes left, so I wanted to get through two questions. So let's try and keep it short and sweet. Um, the first one is, what do you guys think are the biggest challenges in the app chain thesis um, that you're going to be facing um, over the next, you know, year to five years? So in the short term, my answer would be interop. Uh, you know, if you have uh, thousands or ten thousands of rollups, you want to make sure that these rollups can communicate easily and share liquidity across. So I think the short term that is something that's going to hit. Uh, many of the projects we're building and they will realize that quickly. In the long term, it's about users. So you may have many roll up, but you need to bring users. So where are the users would be would be a longer term question. Totally. Um, I'll, I'll add, yeah, interop is a huge problem. Um, also just like general UX, a, a lot of the tools that, that users are used to using like MetaMask, they're not really built for a world where like you might be interacting with like 20, 30 chains. And so that that's like changing quite, quite quickly. And there are like a lot of new tools being developed, but I think, you know, those kind of UX barriers are going to need to be overcome before we, we see like massive adoption of, of app chains. 100% agree. Interrupt and yeah. You know, last one, and then um, I know we have to, we're, you know, um, we have to pass along to the next panel. Um, how should guys, you know, give us one last parting thought with, you know, what do you think distinguishes, you know, your role as a service provider from 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 the others? Um, obviously, you know, great teams building. Um, like you know, if, if you know potential clients want to work with Outlayer or Caldera, like what is the one thing that they should um, they, they should know about you guys that you can leave them as a parting thought with um, Matt? If you want to just get us started there, and then Amrit, right, obviously. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so so first of all, like have a lot of respect for all the teams building in this space. I, I think it's it's competitive, which is great because it means that you know that end projects and users and developers are, are ultimately the ones who who win. Um, for us, I think. Um, for the folks who are thinking about choosing a RAS, I think, I think they should think about both just like the general costs of the RAS, also the business model, the long-term business model of, of the RAS provider, how the RAS plans to make money, um, you know, whether that's aligned with, with the project's kind of end business goals and business interests. Um, and I think for us in general as well, in addition to that, um, we have a really, really big focus on support and, uh, and reliability. Like, Reliability is like a table stakes thing for infrastructure. I'm sure everyone will, will talk about it, but like we want to make sure that our nodes are up like as close to 100% of the time as possible. Rollups are like, you know, probably the most important infrastructure for a lot of the teams that are building their own chain. So just like making sure the sequencer is always online, always producing blocks, the RPCs are performing, et cetera. Um, and support for us, like we work with teams basically from the start when they're ideating, when they're thinking about what features to build into the chain, all the way to post launch when they grow, et cetera. And I think for folks who are thinking about like building a chain, you know, it's it's quite hard to switch providers once you choose one. So they should really think about like finding a long-term partner who's going to support them in the growth. Yeah, well, awesome. on our end, we believe that, you know, eventually many of these people who come to us, they would like to a much more open system as well. So we basically do not want to be stuck with one single RAS bar. So we're also thinking about how to make it much more future-proof where, you know, you will have a much more open system. You could say, hey, I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, you, know, you know, to be working with the RAS provider in a closed system, but eventually I want to bring the system outside of RAS and I want to bring this internally. Or maybe at some point I will bring, make it much, much more open where I want to, uh, get uh, let's say figment guys and blog demon and whatnot of the world to come and come and operate from these services, and this way you could get the network effect and the ecosystem you know effect that 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 those party bring you. So we are, we are open and thinking about those things as well. So that makes uh, you know gives benefit to 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 the people who come to us. And more importantly, we also contribute back to some of these tech stacks that are being built. Again, not everything is perfect, which means that many of the RAS providers who actually are dealing with some of these. Uh, clients and codes and SDKs, they actually have to contribute in meaningful ways as well. So we also are uh, contributing in those ways where, you know, you could have something like interoperability, you could have fast finality and those sort of things that comes out of the box with some of the providers like us. So yeah, um, this is this is how we are thinking about this space in general, uh, RAS space in general. Awesome. Um, well, thank you. Um, this is our time and uh, this is great. This is a great conversation. I hope, uh, hope the audience enjoyed it. Um, thanks, Anna. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. These were incredible insights, to be honest. Like you, you shared a lot of insights and how projects can uh, start benefiting from the orbit chains and as well about the blob space. And yeah, this is this is a huge thing for 
for for the future i, I I'm, I'm sure where everything is going to be cheaper and where there is going to be more memory for in the blob space so yeah well uh, i think it's huge as well because according to the organization layer two beat this organization that uh, analyzes and may do research about all the layer two state arbitrum one is the most decentralized and advanced scaling solution so now permissionlessly permissionlessly be able to launch your own orbit chain benefit benefiting from all of this is awesome so yeah thank you matthew and Rit and aj for joining us today it was great <laughs>